in Life Urban Ministry, where faith and activism meet. Here's your host, Brother Leon Prophet to the streets and pastor to the people. What's going on, Instagram Live family? What is going on, Truth and Life Urban Ministry family? I am your pastor, Pastor Leon Prophet to the streets, pastor to you, the people. Let's go on in this peace, let's pray. So the one thing that I want you guys to understand is that we're going to be talking about church hurt today. And the one thing that I want you to know is that church hurt is a reality. Church hurt is the reality of spiritual systems that have now allowed abuse to get into those systems. Because the one thing about systems, systems have meant and men are not perfect, even though God is perfect. But the one thing that I want you guys to understand is that people are not perfect. And so a lot of times we go to spiritual places, seeking counsel, seeking confirmation, seeking affirmation. And the crazy thing is, is that we run into the wrong people and those people, they don't treat us delicately. You know, their hands, you know, may be rough. Their hands may be bloody. Their hands may be hands of torture. And so the one thing that I want you to understand is that every church or every mosque or whatever is not toxic. But the one thing that I want you to understand is that you have to set up boundaries within your own life when it comes to church when it comes to spiritual people you have to be in a place where you're like okay I'm not going to allow this into my life so the Bible does say that we are supposed to give honor to where honor is due but the one thing that I don't want you to do is to get caught up into this whole cult of toxic honor where you honor a man or a woman of God or even a spiritual place even though that spiritual place or that man of God or that woman of God has violated you or they have violated other people. And so a lot of times those systems and those people in those systems who have been, um, you know, hypnotized, bewitched, they have been indoctrinized into the fact of, you know, my pastor can do no wrong, even though he has violated people. And then they tell you to get over it. And then they tell you other things. And so the crazy thing that I want you to understand is that when it comes to church hurt or faith trauma, there just isn't no getting over it. It is a process. And for somebody to tell somebody to get over it, they don't have any empathy or compassion. And the one thing that I want you to know is that is not God. And so you got to begin to set up parameters and boundaries in your life so that you can begin to navigate in in this church world, in these church streets. I wrote a book a long time ago. It's out of print, but pretty soon it will be in print called Church Member 101. And And it is a guide on how to integrate into the local church. And so joining a church is just like a marriage. And we're going to talk about that in the message. But let me pray for you because... The one thing that I want you to understand and know is that no person can curse you because the one thing you are blessed by God and there should not be a man or a woman of God who is cursing you because you disagree with them or they're cursing you because you have left their, left their, their church. And so that's the one thing that I want you to come away with this message Don't allow nobody to curse you. And you are not cursed because you left somebody's ministry. You are not cursed because you joined another church. Because at the end of the day, the Bible does say that, or it gives the illustration of, one man planteth and another man watereth, but God is the one that gets the increase. And so this is what I want you to understand, know, and do, is that God is the one. All souls belong to God. Your soul does not belong to your pastor. Your soul does not belong to your bishop. Your soul does not belong to the prophet or the prophetess or the church mother. 
your soul belongs to God. And at the end of the day, you're going to stand before God. Your pastor is going to stand before God. And they're going to stand before God for how they treated you or what they did with you. Because if they didn't add to your life, then that's going to be a judgment against them. If they have taken away from your life, if they have violated you, if they have put you in a position where as you don't even want church anymore, then God is going to hold them accountable. That is blood on their hands. Because there is a difference between a shepherd and a hireling. There's a whole lot of hirelings out here who call themselves shepherds. And so you got to know the difference between the two. So let's pray. Father, Lord God, we thank you, Lord, for this time in the word. We thank you, Father, Lord God, that your word is forever settled in heaven. And that, Lord, that you are the healer. In the name of Jesus, I break the curse words. I break the curse words of toxic leadership in the name of Jesus words that people will not prosper because they left their ministry that people are not anointed because they left their fellowship or their ministry and in the name of Jesus I break the toxic bonds of spiritual parents in the name of Jesus I break it in the name of Jesus and I call you free in Jesus name I call you free from the toxicity and the need of having to have a spiritual father or a spiritual mother that does not watch for your soul, but they take your resources. I break it in the name of Jesus. I break the soul ties of toxicity and corrupt leaders, leaders that are abusive, that call themselves shepherds, but they're ravening wolves in shepherd's clothing. In the name of Jesus, I break the hold. I break it in the name of Jesus. I break the spirit of abuse in the name of Jesus that you have had from leaders who have spoken ill against you, from leaders who have spoken against your marriage, from leaders that have spoken against your business, from leaders that have spoken against your ministry. I break it in the name of Jesus. I break the words and I call you free. I declare that you are free in the name of Jesus and you have not sinned by leaving those places and you have not sinned by leaving those people because God does not want you in a place of abuse and God wants you free and God wants you clear in the name of Jesus. I call your freedom. I declare it right now in the name of Jesus that the words that were spoken that the, even the prayers that were prayed against you and against your success, that those words are null and void because the Bible says that no weapon that is formed against you, it will not prosper and every tongue that rises up against you, you shall condemn in the name of Jesus. I break the power of those words and even those weaponized prayers, I break them in the name of Jesus. You are free in Jesus' name. So the one thing that I want you to understand is this, is that when it comes to these church streets, I'm going to tell you, man, it's rough. I'm, I'm telling you right now, it is rough because the thing about church is that we walk in there and we, you know, sometimes we have blinders on. We don't do research. We don't visit for long periods of time. And then the crazy thing is, as soon as we get in here, we realize like, oh my God, what did I just get myself into? Because a lot of times, man, churches can wear a mask just like people wear a mask and you don't know what you really got until they take it off. And it's the same thing with a church. Because the one thing I'm, I'm going to tell you this is that most pastors know that most people do not read. A lot of people know that most people do not read. A lot of church members don't read their Bible until they get to church on Sunday. And a lot of times, it's what is put up on the screen. They don't even open a physical Bible. Now they have a Bible app. And a lot of times with the Bible app, the Bible app has continually changed from what is written. And so the one thing that it will behoove you to know what the scripture says. My pastor told us, get into the word until the word gets in you. The 
Holy Spirit, Jesus spoke about the Holy Spirit like this, that he will take what is mine and he will show it unto you. So the word belongs to you. Jesus is the word personified. So the Holy Spirit can lead you and guide you into all the truth. The Holy Spirit can lead you and guide you in scripture. But you got to begin to number one, okay, judge it in scripture, but also judge it in life. Because the Bible does say that that ye which are spiritual, you judge all things. Now, granted, I'm the type of person, I'm not going to put my personal judgment on people. But when you have to look at certain things and know whether or not you want to be involved with them, look at the fruit of their life. Because as it is above, so it is be- so it should be below. And you can't sit up here and say, hey, this is my spiritual father, this is my spiritual mother, but they ain't taking care of their natural stuff. How you gonna have how you gonna be a spiritual father and you ain't even honoring and taking care of your natural kids? Seriously. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm speaking this today. I'm saying this to some of these pastors. How is it that you call yourself a spiritual father, but you ain't even taking care of your natural kids? You ain't paying no child support. You ain't made no visits. These kids are abandoned, but you got all these spiritual sons and daughters who are giving into you, sowing into you, and you talking to them on a regular, and your family hasn't even seen your face. So how is that? So this is the one thing that I don't want you to get caught up in. I don't want you ever thinking that you need a spiritual parent because this is the buzzword of today. The buzzword of today is honor, that toxic honor mess, that whole spiritual parent mess. It's a buzzword. Because at the end of the day, you don't need it because God is your father. God is your father. God is your spiritual father. He is the father of all. So why do you think that you need a man, that you need flesh to give you affirmation, to give you confirmation? Seriously, ask yourself that. So this is the reason why we're going to do this message. And I'm not going to lie. Most likely, it's probably going to end up being in two parts. I can see it now. Because the one thing that I want you to see is this, is that there's a whole lot of game that goes on in this church world, especially in the black church world. I'm not going to lie, man. That thing can be like the drug game. And you got guys on the bottom who are hungry trying to get in. You got your mid-level guys, and then you got your top-level guys. All it takes is one call from a top-level guy to a low-level guy or mid-level guy, and he can be set for life. And I'm going to give you an example. Say like like right now, I'm on Instagram. If T.D. Jakes calls me up and say, hey, Leon, I want you to come and preach, and I want you to come to the Potter's house, and we're going to put you on the air on Sunday morning. You're going to be on the main stage. Do you not know before the end of the message, all of my friend requests will be filled. All of, all of my following will probably be maxed out. I'll probably end up having fake pages because now people have seen me because of the exposure and that exposure alone will probably generate all types of money and all types of access. And all types of speaking engagements like, yo, Brother Leon's on T.D. Jakes. Yo, I got to have him at my church. They weren't even thinking about me being at that church before but because of T.D. Jakes. Now, I'm in high demand. So that just lets you know all it takes is one call from one person. And so the crazy thing about it is that when you get in these circles and when you get in this thing, it's about access. I'm telling you, man, preaching and ministry at times is like the drug game because it's about to come back. Every drug dealer has to make sure that his people come back and buy from him. And when you're in church, it's about what type of vision can I sell you? What type of dream or hope can I sell you? Because it's about to come back. Yeah, the message is about God, but we want you to come back to us. Us in particular, not nobody else, just us. And that's what I mean when I say that this thing, it can be rough. It can be like a machine. It can eat up people and spit them out with no conscience. And so 
I'm telling you this because I want you to be aware. My thing and the reason why I really got in into ministry is because I got tired of seeing churches and ministry, you know, as a whole, just eat up people. And I wanted to be that type of person that was going to fight for people who could not fight for themselves in these spiritual streets. And so this is the reason why I say what I say. And this is the reason probably why I don't get many engagements because I'm the type of person, I will give you the truth. I'm going to tell you the game and it'll be for free because this thing is a church game. This thing is a game when it comes to people's money because a lot of these people, they ain't hearing from God. They have a budget that they have to meet and then they take and manipulate you and then say, God said, Ooh, there's a hundred people in here that's supposed to give a thousand dollars. God told me that it's a hundred people in here or 50 people in here that's supposed to give $200. And the crazy part about it is that a lot of times it ain't even like that. It's because they ain't got no money. The church ain't got no money. The church ain't been balancing its books. And so you have to begin to manipulate the people to give so that you can keep the lights on in the church. And I'm going to tell you, man, a lot of times ministers, they get in over their head because they got a calling from God, but they ran before God. And then they wonder why they got to beat the people. I'm going to tell you this. Make sure that your pastor is the type of pastor that wants to preach and don't have to preach. Seriously. Because the one thing that you don't want is you don't want a pastor that is controlled by the pulpit. They're controlled by that mortgage. They're controlled by that rent. Because they will beat you silly trying to make ends meet. Especially if they got a small congregation. And even when they got a large congregation. So the thing is, is that you have to make sure that you are not in any of those type of scenarios and situations. You have to begin to court a church and a, a church has to court you just like you being courted in a marriage. You have to begin to date. You have to begin to see, okay, what's this? What's that? How do they react to this? How do they react when the money ain't, ain't, ain't right? How does the pastor act when he calls in the guest and the money's not good? Is he going to say, hey, hold up, this ain't enough? Is he going to be like that? Because I've seen that. I've seen the pastor demand that you put more money in that offering basket when a guest was there. I've seen it because they didn't have money to give to that man or that woman. And they was depending on the people to make up the difference. I've seen it. I'm serious. I've also seen pastors calling other pastors to try to generate funds. So they'll sit up here and have a prophet, give you all types of crazy prophecies. Who you going to get a Lexus? God told me you're going to get this. And the people was just giving money out to yin yang. Crazy. I've seen it. And then the prophecies don't come to pass. And then that man comes back the next year and give the same prophecy. I've seen it. So I'm going to tell you right now, it is game in these streets. But you got to have discernment and you have to have wisdom so that you don't get caught up. And a lot of us have to get healed from seeing things like that. A lot of us have to get healed from being a part of systems like that. I'm telling you, man, I was a part of a system that was just, you know, it was a well-oiled machine. It was a well-oiled machine. And it was all about one aspect of the Old Testament. And then people just giving money and people getting prophecies. And I don't even know if them prophecies even came to pass. Because we were told just, you know, give them exhortation and comfort. And a lot of it, I don't even know if it was the word of the Lord. It was just some, some words of affirmation and confirmation. And that's what you're paying for. And then you're getting a call from, from an operator to give more money. And so the crazy thing about it is that I totally get that in order for church to work that you have to sell. But the one thing that I don't want you to be, I don't want you to be gullible. And the one thing that I want you to understand and know is this, is that a lot of churches, they are not transparent with their money. And a lot of them have blown their money on projects that they know could not be sustained. And that's the God knows truth. But the average minister is not going to tell you that. And so some days I have wondered, have I canceled myself? Seriously. I've wondered that because I look back and I'm like, Lord, <laughs> should I be saying this? Because ministry is about engagements. 
And sometimes, man, when you speak the truth, it's like, yo, man, some people don't like that. Some ministers ain't going to like what I say because I'm giving up the tapes. But my thing is, I care more about you than I do some of these other dudes and some of these other women because they don't care about you. But I look at you as God's people, God's sons and daughters. I look at you as God's sheep. And I don't want nobody taking advantage of God's sheep if I call myself a shepherd. And don't fall for this whole thing of you, you know, trying to date your pastor, trying to have sex with your pastor. No, it's not going to work. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you use the sheep and shepherd model, you are committing spiritual bestiality. Because how is it that the shepherd going to be knocking boots with the sheep? Or if you use the spiritual son, spiritual daughter dynamic, then you're committing spiritual incest. How are you going to have a person that you're giving them counsel from the pulpit and then you sexing them after the pulpit? They come to you for counsel and you giving them something else. So I'm telling you right now, do not fall for that. Because at the end of the day, God is going to hold them accountable, but I don't want you to be gullible and be victimized. A lot of people have gone into pastors' offices and them doors were shut and atrocities and victimization has taken place physically, emotionally, financially. People up here signing over their house, signing over this, signing over that, and you know people's credits being violated. Pastors up here operating with Ponzi schemes. And these are the things that happen. And I was a part of a church, and, and, I, and the church got caught up in a Ponzi scheme. And we was gullible enough to be praying that God will fix it. Please, God is not going to fix it when we robbing people. And this is what I mean about being gullible. A lot of times, man, we get into things because the pastor said, and we don't even, you know, look at it fully. We don't even look at it and be like, yo, okay, what is this? Explain it to me. We just come in here because the pastor said. And a lot of us have been victimized and traumatized by other people because of what the pastor said. So I'm telling you right now, it has to stop. So we're going to get into this message. I can see right now that it is definitely probably going to be two-part because it's almost 11 o'clock and I've been talking and haven't even gotten into the message. So I want you to, number one, be aware. And also, don't have unrealistic expectations. Your pastor is not God. He may, I'm telling you, he can preach his butt off. He can probably prophesy all over the place, but at the end of the day, that man is flesh. And the Bible says, have no confidence in the flesh. He is just a conduit. He is just a tool. But he is not God. And don't you worship him as God. And that's the God knows truth. Don't worship a man or a woman as God. A pastor told me this. When you get the order right, you get the flow right. First there's God, then there's you. Then there's your spouse. And then after that, your kids, and then everybody falls under that. Your pastor should not be in a place where God is. Your pastor should not be in a place where your spouse is. And that's the God knows truth. Too many times we have allowed our pastors and our, our ministers to be in a place where they shouldn't be. And then they up here run, um, having their opinions mess up our house. A pastor's conviction messed up my house. His personal conviction messed up my house because my ex-wife thought that it was revelation from God and that she was willing to follow it. But it wasn't until another person of God took and told my ex-wife, hey, you need to take care of your house. And that thing broke. But the question that I had is why did it take that when your spouse should be the most influential voice in your house next to God? Because first there's God, then there's you, then your spouse. Nobody in ministry should be able to come into your house and make decisions that you ain't going to be able to sleep with, that you ain't going to be able to live with. And that's what a lot of pastors have done. And that's the God knows truth. They have made decisions and done things that 
messed up people's lives, messed up people's houses. And so I'm telling you right now, man, don't fall for that. Don't allow these pastors, prophets, apostles, evangelists, teachers to have more say in your house than your spouse. That's what I'm saying. Because it happened to me. And I wrote a book about it called Let No Man Put a Sunder, Pick It Up on Amazon. Oh, Lord, I thank you. This is definitely going to be a good word. I see it now. I see it now. So, the one thing about healing from church hurt is this. Is that, number one, you heal from church hurt just like you heal your body. It's going to take some time. And it's also going to take some counseling. And a lot of times you can't get hurt by the system. You can't get healed by the system that hurt you. So you're going to have to go outside. And that's just being honest. I'm going to say it again. You can't be healed in the same place that hurt you. So you're going to have to leave. And you might have to go seek out counseling, whether it is with, you know, psychological counseling with the organization, you know, in the medical field or maybe even in another uh, with another spiritual house but make sure that that person is licensed to counsel a lot of times man these people giving counsel and yeah they got biblical wisdom and knowledge but they don't have the whole psychological aspect so you might need people that got papers seriously you might need people that have papers and that's the God knows truth so Let's go in here. Let's go into the message. I want to give you this scripture. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 to 6. Surely he hath borne our griefs and have carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord have laid on him the iniquity of us all. So the one thing that I want you to see in this is that the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And so when it comes to church hurt, our peace is being chastised in church hurt. But the one thing that I like about God and that he laid upon Jesus the iniquity, the crooked way, the pain, the hurt, the violation, it was all laid upon him. And it says in Colossians, and he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So those things were nailed to the cross and he took them out of the way. And they were buried with him. And he arose free from those things. Free from iniquity. Having overcome it. Having overcome sin, hell, death, and the grave. He hath done that. And he did it for you. And so the one thing that I want you to see and understand. That if it died with him. And he rose up triumphant. And it couldn't hold him. Then church hurt will not hold you. And you can rise up and you can be renewed in your mind and in your body. What is church hurt? Church hurt or faith trauma is abuse caused by ministerial leaders and their members upon other congregants and even visitors to a local church body. So the one thing that I want you to know about church hurt is this, is that a lot of times, not only is it the leadership, but also it could be the inner circle of that leadership and sometimes even the congregants. And so that's the one thing that I want you to see is that church, church abuse or faith trauma is not just limited to just leadership. Sometimes the people can act the same way as the leader because the Bible says, like people, like priests. And I'm just paraphrasing. So you have to know what type of spiritual atmosphere you are entering. And that's the God knows truth. Know your surroundings. Know what type of spiritual environment that you're entering. Just because they play music and got a good organ player and got people that can sing doesn't mean that that house is healthy. It might mean that they're musical. But that don't mean that they're healthy. And that's the God knows truth. 
So the one thing that I want you to realize in this is that no church is exempt from toxicity. If they get into deception, if they allow certain things and they don't check it, then that church can become a toxic house. A lot of times you hear the term Ichabod. And what does Ichabod mean? It means that the glory of the Lord has departed. And sometimes that can be on a person and that can be upon a church and even a group of people. So I'm telling you right now, you have to have discernment. You have to begin to listen to your gut. You have to begin to look beyond, you know, the, the, the window dressing and see what really is there. And that's the God knows truth. So let's go back in here. The abuse in church can be at times verbal abuse. And that's what I mean with false prophecies. Pastors talking to you any old type of way. Giving you doom and gloom if you don't do this. Because the one thing I'm going to tell you is this. They will give you religion to control you. But they will never give you truth to free you. And that's the God knows truth. The Bible says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But they will use control mechanisms like religion, like the fear of hell, the fear of devils, the fear of of disappointing the house, disappointing God as a control mechanism. They'll use those things to keep you in check because religion keeps men bound. But truth is the thing that frees them. So let's go back in here. At times, the abuse in church hurt can be at times verbal abuse. So it can be verbal abuse. It can be physical abuse. Physical abuse in the form of you going up the prayer line and you getting beat. You getting hit. Somebody hitting your back. Somebody punching you in the stomach. I've seen that. I've seen somebody call themselves healing a person, delivering a person, because they done read about Smith Wigglesworth doing it, so they decide to punch somebody in the stomach, thinking that they punching the devil in the stomach, only to realize that they ain't got that type of anointing. They don't have that type of focus. They don't have that type of spiritual power, so now you just punched out a person. And now they got to cover it up by pushing you down and then covering you up while you crying. Because you just got punched. I remember one time, man, I was I was going up for prayer. And I went up for prayer. Next thing I know, man, my pastor is up here slapping me. And then the next thing he did was punch me in my chest. And the crazy thing about it is that my son was in the audience and he saw all of that and started getting mad. Started getting mad. Like, why, why is he hitting my dad? But the crazy thing about it is that a lot of times you don't know how abusive an environment is until you leave. And then all of a sudden now, the lights come on. You come to yourself. You are like, I cannot believe I allowed myself to go through that. But that's what I went through, thinking that I was getting deliverance, thinking that God was touching me. Does God have to slap you? Does God have to punch you? Does God have to kick you? Because I've even seen videos over in Africa of a pastor just taking a belt and just whooping his people physically. I'm telling you, man, deliverance should not be you getting hit. I don't care what type of devil you got or they say that you have. Deliverance should not be you physically putting your hands on somebody and slapping a mess out of them or punching them or beating them, thinking that you're beating the devil out. No, you're just beating a person. And you got a devil, <laughs> you got a bigger devil because you're a bully. That's a God knows truth. You got people trying to pray the gay away, trying to pray certain stuff off of people, and all it is is nothing but trauma, nothing but pain, physical and verbal abuse calling a person a faggot. Serious. And the crazy thing about it is that we don't realize that the devil is making mockery of us because we're not walking in true authority. And we yelling. We scaring folks. And you wonder why people don't want to come back to church. I'm going to tell you right now. Church hurt and faith trauma 
is so rampant in, 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 in the black community alone is that it has turned into a business. People now have counseling businesses to help people heal from church trauma. So that just lets us know like we ain't doing our jobs as the church. If a person can set up counseling for the stuff that we cause, oh yeah, there's a problem. So I'm telling every pastor right now, if that is the case, then you need to get the hell out. Because it shouldn't be no reason why there's counselors to counsel people to get over stuff that the church has caused. We should be the shepherds. We should give our life for the sheep instead of taking the life for the sheep. We up here, man, cutting up sheep and making lamb chops and eating them. And ain't got no conscience. Just like the sons of Eli. So I'm telling you right now, man, something has to give. And I'm telling you right now, until your eyes are open, a lot of times you ain't going to know that it's abuse. A lot of times you ain't going to know how hurt you are until you get outside of that. Because a lot of times, man, we can be in a toxic environment for so long that we think that it's the norm. We think that it's the norm when our pastor is talking to us all harshly. And then we sit up here and we say, man, I need a hard word because I know how I am. So in other words, man, you need somebody to beat spirituality into you. You need fear mechanisms. You need the mechanism of hell. You need somebody to talk to you rough, to handle you roughly. And so you need to ask yourself, why, why am I like that? If you need somebody to beat you on Sunday, then you need to ask yourself, what is it about me that I need somebody to hit me on Sunday? That I need somebody to bash me with the word? That I need somebody to cut me up? Some of us, man, we're masochists. We're spiritual masochists. And because we're spiritual masochists, we gravitate to those areas and to those churches that's going to give us that pleasure. Oh, I like the fact that my past is hard on me. I like the fact that my pastor beats on me and that he cut me up. And the crazy thing about it is that sometimes these people beat you up, cut you up, and they ain't even trying to heal you up. Because they like to beat Sunday after Sunday, beat you on Wednesday, beat you on Saturday, beat you in your pockets, beat you in your mind, beat you in your body, and you okay with it. I'm telling you, man, we have to begin to change our mindsets. And that's the God knows truth. We have got to change our mindset when it comes to God. Because some of these pastors are not operating the way God does. Because God ain't going to beat us like that. God ain't going to talk to us like that. God ain't going to shun us like that. But I'm telling you, man, that's why you need to know the difference between man and God and a lot of times we get the lines blurred and we think that it's God when it's actually man it ain't God it ain't a shepherd it's a hireling they in it for the money and so you need to understand that there are four M's in ministry four M's in life there is what is the motive what is their motive behind ministry what is what is the the method that they minister in what is the message that they're sending and what is the manner in which they do it? What is the mannerism of that person? Because some of these people, they want you to honor them, but they're not willing to live an honorable life. They're not willing to give you honor. They talk to you any old type of way. They violate you, violate your house, violate your boundaries. But you're supposed to honor them. Wake up. And this is why I'm willing to give you the game because I'm getting sick and tired of God's people being taken advantage of. The abuse in church hurt can be at times verbal, physical, and even sexual abuse. You can, you can be sexually abused in the church by somebody groping on you. You can be sexually abused in church. Somebody calls themselves counseling you. And the next thing you know, man, they taking advantage of you, taking advantage of your vulnerability. You having problems in your marriage. And next thing you know, the past, well, yeah, maybe I should be your husband. And then next thing you know, you enter into an affair with him or her or them. And then they end up kicking you to the curb. And now you really devastated. 
I'm telling you right now, man. Don't allow it. I, I remember. I did a, I did a episode on the Brother Leon show. And I played the clip of people exposing a pastor who had sex with an underage girl. And the crazy thing about it is that he called himself stepping down. But the people that he violated came and told the church everything. And then he felt his own. He didn't do nothing because the law in his state stated that it was consensual sex, even though she was underage. But the crazy thing about it is that some of these churches and pastors need to get sued because when you go to them for counseling, every church needs to have the federal government needs to put a law that states that if you go in for counseling in a pastor and a pastor violates you, whether it be financially, sexually, or whatever, then you have the right to sue. And that's the reason why a lot of these churches are carrying malpractice insurance. Because at the end of the day, they don't want to get sued for their misgivings, for their misdiagnosis. Because that's why I say a lot of these pastors are not professionals. And if you're going to sit up here and take advantage, then that family or that person should have the right to sue you. And sue you to the point where you lose your 501c3 status. Yeah, I said it. Because you can't sit up here and call yourself counseling somebody, and next thing you know, you're sleeping with them. Because even in the professional world, they sign documents stating that, no, I'm not going to enter into a romantic relationship with you, a sexual relationship with you, or even a financial relationship with you. That's what they sign. I remember when I went in for counseling, I had to sign documents that stated that I was not going to enter and my counselor was not going to enter into a physical relationship with me or a financial relationship with me because I was under their care. Because the crazy thing about it is that you fall under vulnerability. You're vulnerable when you're counseling with a person. That person is opening you up. And if they take advantage of that, then they need to pay the cost. They need to be penalized. And so some of these pastors, man, yo, they have violated you in the wrong way. And I'm here to tell you, you can love them, you can forgive them, and you can still call the cops on them. And I'm encouraging you to do so if they have violated you. The abuse can also be emotional and financial. So there it is right there. The abuse can be financial. It can be emotional. Because now, you know, here it is. They treating you some type of way. When you first came in, you was you was like sliced bread. And now, all of a sudden, now, you done been there for a while. And now, man, please, who are you? Or you done spoke up against them. And, you know, who are you? But the one thing I'm going to tell you, man, a lot of churches, they want members. But they want those members to be yes men. They don't never want to be challenged or questioned about anything. And so you need to guard yourself. When you're in an environment that won't allow you to question, that won't allow you to challenge certain things, then you need to ask yourself, am I in the right place? Because cults do that type of stuff. You should always be able to get a straight answer from your pastor or who's ever in leadership. You should always be able to get a straight answer. Or they might have to say, well, hey, look, I can't give you an answer now, but I'm going to come back with one. And if they come back with one or they don't come back with one, that might not be the place you want to be. Because, yeah, people want members, but a lot of them just want yes men. And the one thing I want to guard you about is that if you're in a place where they're talking about praying against another house to close down, get out. Because how is it that the Bible says that the harvest is right, but the laborers are few, and you up here praying that another person's ministry was shut down because you, quote-unquote, got a mandate for the region. Seriously, you have that many members to take on a whole city, and you say you you here to take over the city. You ain't even got that many members. Everybody needs help, but the one thing that you won't find out about ministry is that a lot of times there are men who are driven by control. They're driven by power. They want that power. They want that control. So unless they run in it, they, they ain't going to be a part of it. Even if, even if it's for the welfare of the city. 
And so that's why they take and pray like that. But they ain't praying against the mosque. They ain't praying against the Hebrew Israelite schools. They ain't praying against the Catholics. They praying against their own. And so the crazy thing about it is that how can we call ourselves the army of the Lord when you got one platoon wishing that another platoon would suffer, would die? And the crazy thing about it, you ain't even got enough men to cover what they giving up or what they're losing, or even them being out the way. I'm, I'm telling you, man, even if y'all join, you still don't have the organizational skills to do it. And all it's about is just trying to get somebody's members and trying to get somebody's money. And a lot of it, man, they done lost it about the city. They don't care. It's about us and ours now. It's tribalism. I'm giving it to you this morning. The abuse can come in, in the form of toxic counseling where you are taken advantage of because you're seeking help by clergy but have been victimized due to your vulnerability. And I told you that. The abuse can come in the form of physical abuse, such as violent praying with the emphasis of getting a person delivered from evil spirits. And I told you about that. Deliverance shouldn't be somebody laying their hands on you and punching you out. Deliverance shouldn't also be them just driving a hand in your head and knocking you on the floor. That's not deliverance. I look at it like this. If, if they cannot use the authority of God and speak words like binding and loosing but they gotta lay their physical hands on you that ain't deliverance seriously that is not deliverance now granted I'm gonna say this there's a difference when the evil spirit manifests and tries to violently hit the person that's doing the deliverance that's totally different that person should be restrained so they don't hurt you or hurt somebody else. And then, you know, you exercise that thing out of them. But it should never be coming from the person that's doing a praying. The first thing you lead in is with a punch. It should never be like that. I'm telling you, man, some of these people, like even in the word of faith, y'all done read Smith Wigglesworth book thinking that you got the power and authority to punch somebody in the stomach and now you getting sued. Because now that person done went in the hospital and they asked what happened and now they done called the cops on you. So I'm telling you right now, man, be wise. This type of abuse will see a minister at times physically beat or hit a congregant. That's what that does. Example, praying the gay away. Example, praying that a person comes into holiness and you beat them until they uh, take their uh, earrings and stuff off. Because your doctrine, the dogma of your doctrine, the, the thing that's in your church is nobody wears jewelry here. And there's been some denominations where they will, you know, beat you until you took them earrings off. Church hurt can also come in the form of shunning a person until they come into the willful obedience to the church leadership or the doctrine of that church. And so, you know, you see the the shunning, you know, when you do a certain thing that violates the leadership or the doctrine of that house. Like you might have had sex outside of marriage or you might have, you know, befriended a person. So they're shunning in the Amish communities and some denominations. Because they have scripture to back them up, which says that, you know, you shouldn't fellowship with certain types of people such as fornicators. You know, don't don't be with a person that don't want to work. But the crazy thing about it is that even in the midst of all of that, life is a journey. And so if we want to have people experience the fullness and the love of God, sometimes we have to bear each other's burdens. Sometimes you're going to have to see the sin on a person and realize that it's coming off of them. But sometimes we can take and weaponize and use isolation as a control mechanism to get people to line up because they're so isolated. And then they end up falling into that and falling, you know, into the clutches of abuse even more because now they're being isolated. They're feeling abandonment. And this is what I mean, man. We got to begin to wake up. Because that does happen. But let me give you the scripture. 
Galatians 6, 1 to 2 out of the King James Version. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. And so the one thing that I want you to understand is that a lot of times churches and and clergy, they will take and judge people by their actions, but they judge themselves by their intentions. They'll take and judge themselves by their intentions, but judge your actions. Even though the Bible does say, you know, that we should bear one another's burdens. Bearing the burden is praying with a person and staying with a person and mentoring a person until they're able to overcome certain things or until they come to a maturity that, okay, I got to deal with this. But a lot of times, churches have weaponized isolation and shunning to get that person to do what's right so that they can be abused even more. So let's go. Church hurt can also come in the form of verbal abuse by false prophecies and people's desperation for a touch of God in the form of a miracle. So church hurt can also be verbal abuse in the form of false prophecies. Like, ooh, sister, God told me that if you take and buy this miracle water, if you take and get this miracle cure or this miracle cloth, that God is going to heal your loved one from cancer. And the crazy thing is, is that It's a marketing scheme of merchandise. I'm telling you right now, don't allow yourself to be merchandised. Don't allow yourself to finance oppression. Because the one thing that I love about Jesus, and I'm seeing this in my mind, is that Jesus said that you have turned the house of God into a house of merchandise. When he threw, you know, the money changers out the temple. Turn not my father's house into a house of merchandise. He was saying, you you turn it into a den of thieves. I'm paraphrasing. And so this is the one thing that I love about God is that you have the illustration of Jesus driving that out. And if Jesus had to drive it out then, it needs to be driven out now because it's a whole lot of merchandising going on. It's a whole lot. Merchandising the people, merchandising deliverance, merchandising spiritual gifts. Now you paying for prophecy. And the crazy thing about it is that they're justified because they have scripture and they use that scripture about Saul going to the prophet and bringing a gift. I'm telling you, man, even though the Bible says Come by without money and without price. Freely you receive, freely give. But the crazy thing about that scripture, it don't say nothing about prophecy. So they can use it. And then they're justified. And then the crazy thing about it is because we're so desperate to hear from God, to get a word from God, that we'll go to these men and women. Because we're so desperate. I'm going to tell you this. You got to begin to... Ask God to deliver you from a scarcity mindset, even when it comes to spiritual things. Lord, deliver me from the scarcity mindset. Deliver me from the scarcity mindset so I won't be so daggone hungry that I'll go after anything. And a lot of people of God have been so hungry that they have gone after anything. You, you, you don't, you so hungry that you willing to drink poison because you so thirsty. You so hungry, you willing to eat bad meat because you're so hungry. You're willing to eat bad meat. You're willing to drink poison or bitter water because you're so thirsty. And that comes from a scarcity mindset. That comes from a poverty mindset. You're so willing to be under these type of houses and churches and people because you have an abandonment mindset. You're afraid of abandonment. And in the name of Jesus, I break the spirit of abandonment off of you that causes you to stay in houses like that. 
You're so afraid of abandonment and being alone that you're willing to stay in abuse. You're willing to try to save and help those people because you don't want nobody to leave you. You don't want nobody to leave your life. But I'm here to tell you this day is that God is delivering you and you're going to wake up. And I'm going to be the alarm. Wake up! It's not God's will. It's not God's will for you to be abused. It's not God's will for you to be taken advantage of. It's not God's will for you to be a punching bag. It's not God's will for you to be a doormat. It's not God's will. So if it's not God's will, then why are you settling for it? God has said in his word that he wants all men to be saved. Not all men to be abused. He wants all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. The knowledge of the truth is this. That yes, the promises of God are yes and amen. It ain't no $1,000 for a car, $10,000 for a mortgage. It ain't no million dollars for healing. Man, please. I was watching the documentary. The richest brother in Africa is selling miracle cures that contain gasoline. And these people are drinking it. Same thing over here. Miracle spring water. Prayer cloves. Merchandise in the saints. And then the crazy thing about it is that some of these people are still dying after people have called out of desperation and you say, hey, buy some more product. Buy some more product. Yo, it's going to work. And it don't. And then the crazy thing is, is that we take and blame the person because they didn't have no faith. They did have faith. They had faith in you and they had faith in that in that false promise. They had faith in that, in that lie. And that lie didn't get them nowhere. Then the crazy thing about it, they go away offended, blaming God when it was you. So I'm telling you, church people, wake up. This is why I wrote my book, Church Member 101. You don't need to be a victim. God ain't called you to be a victim. And you need to know, yo, where those things take place at. Should no pastor be sleeping with your wife or sleeping with your daughter? Telling you, man. Why a 60-some-year-old man gonna marry an 18-year-old girl? He been grooming her for a long time. Yeah, I said it. I'm telling you, man. Even though the Bible does say that the gifts and callings are without repentance, the one thing I'm going to tell you is this, is God is going to bring judgment to every man that is taking advantage and using his gift and his calling. And the crazy thing about it is that a lot of people don't even recognize consequence. You can't sit up here and do people dirty and expect your life to go right. I don't care how anointed you are. You can't sit up here and expect... To, to, to not have consequence visit you when you treat people dirty. Let me give you this scripture in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 23, verses 31 to 32. Behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongue and say, he saith. Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them and cause my people to err by their lies and by their likeness. Yet I sent them not nor commanded them. Therefore, they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. So I'm telling you, man, a false prophet is like a wooden nickel. They ain't going to, they're not going to profit you. People that say that the Lord said and the Lord didn't say. People that say that the pastor said and the pastor didn't say. Because you got those type of people out there too. So I'm telling you right now, man, you have to be aware of what is out here. You have to be aware and come into discernment and know that, yeah, God is the good shepherd, that Jesus is the good shepherd. But there's also hirelings out here. There's also people that have the garment of a priest, that have the garment of a shepherd. But inwardly, they're ravening wolves. Meaning basically, yo, they they love blood. They love flesh. 
So I'm telling you right now, man, you have to be aware and you have to watch out. Because trust and believe, man, to, to heal from church hurt is a process. Because sometimes that hurt can be verbal. Sometimes that hurt can be emotional, financial, and physical, and sexual. And we need God to heal us. But like I said, you can't be healed staying in the place that violated you. I don't care how how they are. You ain't going to never find closure there. You ain't going to never find affirmation there. Because they didn't protect you. And if they didn't protect you, then how can you trust? And you can only come into manifestation when you trust. Because trust helps belief. And when you believe, it can manifest. But you got to trust what you believe. Oh, Lord. I'm telling you right now. We, we definitely going to have to do part two because I done been at this for an hour already and I'm not even through half my notes. But I want to give you this. Church hurt can come in the form of financial abuse. And I'm going to stop here. and We're going to come back next week. Church hurt can come in the form of financial abuse where you are told if you give certain amounts of money, you will receive an exclusive blessing from God. So I'm telling you right now, man, you have to watch out for those that talk about that that seed faith or that you know you're you're giving a, a financial seed for this or you're giving a financial seed for that and you need to know where that comes from because the crazy thing about it is that you don't even see that in New Testament it's all Old Testament and people take and weaponize scripture will a man rob God seriously but the crazy thing about it is that They use Old Testament, but they hardly ever use the New Testament. And then on top of that, the crazy thing is, is that you're constantly giving, 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 giving. I do believe this, that when you do give, you will get back. That if giving is a part of your life, then the Bible does says give and it shall be given unto you. But a lot of times when you, when it's transactional, you don't know what you're getting back. And that's what it is a lot of times when you're paying for prophecies. So what's the difference between you paying for a prophecy and you going to a fortune teller? What's the difference? What's what's the difference in you paying a fortune teller versus one of these prophets? So I'm telling you right now, man, wake up. Because here's, here's the one thing I want to tell you. When the prosperity message came out, I do believe that it was a revelation from God. However, the only parts that we saw as congregants was the spiritual aspect. Very rarely did these same men of God or women of God bring people from the financial arena to give us the physical part of it so that we can uh, walk in the fullness of what God wanted to do. So if I'm up here getting a uh, prophecy that, that because I sold that God was going to give me a supernatural debt cancellation, then I need to know from, from the door that if God is going to do this, then I need to know, okay, don't be signing certain contracts. Don't be doing payday loans. Don't be going back into credit card debt. And a lot of times we as people, we just did not know. You can't sit up here and say, God, I'm going to give me a supernatural debt cancellation and I don't even know the language of finance in the natural world. So how can I walk in that when I don't know? And the Bible says that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And so because I don't have the knowledge on finance, how can I walk in the fullness of that prophecy? I just sold, but there's no cultivation. I can't begin to cultivate what God said that he was going to do. And a lot of times those prophetic words drop into our souls, into our spirits, into our hearts, but they need cultivation. So you got to begin to get knowledge. And so that's the one thing that we lacked in when it came to that prosperity message. And then the crazy thing about it, we only saw one way. We saw the preacher with the big house, with the big car. And here it is. We losing cars, being repoed, and we trying to keep up giving, thinking God going to turn things around. And the crazy thing about it is that if you would have had knowledge, you would have known like, hey, 
Let's take and handle and, and, and do this debt like, you know, a debt snowball. We'll take the first one first and then go up. And then, yeah, we will definitely see God giving us supernatural debt cancellation. Because there's some things that you can make an agreement on or have mediation and then they can cancel that thing and then make sure that they take it off your credit. But because we didn't know this and all we did was just give money, we didn't see it. And the only person that benefited was the person that received it. So I'm telling you right now, man, a lot of, a lot of preachers are not touching this because number one, you know, they know that, Hey, I need to bring in people to help these people get out of debt. They ain't going to do that because some of them don't care about you. And some of them just don't know. Seriously. Some of them just don't know. And at that time, that's what it was. Some people, man, they are exploiting you. They're exploiting your money. You signing over this to the church. You signing over that to the church. And then you wonder why the church owns all your assets after your mama done died or after your grandmama done died because she done signed it all over. And then they still want you to uh, pay for the funeral when they the church and got most of your assets. Got the house, got the car, got the trust, got the money. And then they send you a bill. So I'm telling you right now, don't fall for it. I'm telling you, man. Ooh, you gonna you you gave that five hundred dollars? You have a five hundred dollar blessing. You have a seed that's gonna endure. It's your endurance seed because you sold five thousand dollars, and then they give you symbolisms of numbers. And what that's supposed to mean? I'm telling you right now, man. Don't fall for it. I'm telling you, don't fall for the snake oil. I'm telling you right now, don't fall for the snake oil. And I'm going to give you this. Matthew 10 and 8. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ye have received, freely give. And a lot of times, these dudes ain't even reading or quoting Matthew 10 and 8. I want to give you this and then I'm done. Isaiah 55 and 1. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, I'm going to read it again. He that hath no money, he that hath no money, come ye by, buy and eat, yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. These prosperity dudes ain't going to tell you that. They're going to tell you something else. These prophetic dudes ain't going to tell you that. They're going to tell you something else. And as much as I love prophecy, man, I've seen prophecy being weaponized. I'm seeing the gift of prophecy being weaponized in some people's lives. I'm seeing the office of the prophet become something else. And I'm here to declare, just like Tiffany Montgomery has said in these past few weeks, who is on the Lord's side? Who is on the Lord's side? Who's on Jezebel's side? Because all them Negroes is eating at Jezebel's table, but who is on the Lord's side? And a lot of people get caught up because they see what's over here. They see what's on the table. And then they get into the network. And the next thing you know, you can't even say what you need to say because now they control you. Now you're being controlled by what's put on the table. You satisfying your belly, you satisfying your flesh, and you totally missing God, and you abusing his people. So who is on the Lord's side? Who's going to stand up for the little guy? Man, this church hurt needs to stop because at the end of the day, God is going to bring into judgment those who have raped his sheep, who have raped his house, who have soiled his name. I'm telling you right now, yo, you cannot be the type of person that is that is delusional when it comes to these houses. I'm telling you, as much as these people are, they know how to do a magic trick. But what is their life? 
Is their life full of scandal? Do they have, you know, or, or do they have a good reputation outside of the church? Or they the type of person, man, they didn't got saved, but they still got bodies. They still got babies out of wedlock. They still got this over here. They still got that over there. And I'm not trying to judge nobody, but all I'm just trying to tell you is that, is this the type of person that you want to be connected to? Because you need to begin to look at a, the fruit of a person's life. Because that fruit will testify for or against. And that's the answer God knows truth. So you have to ask yourself, what am I willing to accept? If you're willing to accept the fact that, yo, he, this person sleeps with their members, that's on you. But the thing is, is that you can't complain about the thing that you allow. And what I mean by that, you allow it in your face. You allow it in your space. And then you have that scarcity mindset that says, well, ain't no other place out here good. Really? Is that what you believe? You believe that your, your abusive pastor is the only person in town preaching the word. So I'm telling you right now, man, wake up because that is bewitching to think like that. To operate like that. To think that that is the only house that is preaching word. I'm telling you, man, some of you, you need to get out of that thing. Oh, if it ain't like this, I don't want it. Because sometimes God does do a new thing. Seriously. <laughs> Behold, I will do a new thing. Shall you not know it? I'm telling you, man. Bible says that that truth shall spring. So you need to ask yourself, what is it that I need to change about my life that's that's going to open up my eyes so I can see this environment that I'm in? Because I'm starting to feel like it's being abusive. But I've been here so long that this is all I know. This is the norm for me. So my prayer today is that your eyes will be open that you will see that you will know the truth and that the truth will make you free. So, hey, guys, we're going to come back. We're going to finish this up next week, but I love you. Whew. This is deep because the one thing I want you to understand is that before you can heal a thing, you have to recognize it. Seriously. You have to recognize it in order to heal it. You have to recognize it in order to be restored. You have to recognize it in order to be reconciled. You have to uh, recognize it in order for you to have full deliverance and come into wholeness and come into a new life. You have to recognize it. And this is what I want you to see. So, yeah, I know we ain't ending like hurrah, hurrah. But the one thing that I want you to understand is that God wants you free. And I'm giving you the game on all of it today. So yeah, this is going to definitely be a two-part message. But I want you guys to be blessed. I might even put this up today. Um, but if I don't put it up today, it'll definitely be up tomorrow. So I want you guys to be blessed. I love you. Come back next week. and We're going to finish up Healing from Church Hurt Part 2. truth and life you have freedom follow truth and life urban ministry on itunes spotify and iHeartRadio. like share and subscribe to truth and life urban ministry all right guys it's been nice i love y'all instagram i'll see you next week peace and love love you